And next we have Stephen Wetherill, who's the MD and the CEO of Lupapa Diamond Company. Stephen is a chartered accountant with more than 20 years experience in financial and operational management. He previously held senior roles with the Beers and Gen Gem Diamonds. And more recently, Stephen has led the successful exploration, evaluation, funding and development of two unique diamond mines in Africa. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Trish. Um, and, and thanks again to, to Bull and the, the Pay Dirt Media team for putting on uh, another important edition of, of Africa Down Under. Um, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of standing side by side with your government partners. And for the second year running, we do miss the, the presence of our Angolan, Lesotho and Botswana and colleagues. Um, I think it's important to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, uh, not only to promote the benefits of investment in our projects, but also to assist them in the greater investment within their countries as well. So thanks, Bill. Let me introduce you to Australia's growing global producer of high-value diamonds. Uh, copies of our presentation are available at our booth on our website, uh, as well as uh, on the ASX platform. And I do urge you to read, uh, read the cautionary statements uh, when you get the opportunity to do so. We're a multi-asset diamond producer uh, focused on developing our next production asset here in Australia. We have already in conjunction with our local partners developed two very special assets, uh, the Lulo mine in Angola and the Mutai mine uh, in Lesotho. We have put out our maiden guidance this year uh, where those two mines, after taking into account the corporate overhead here in Perth, are expected to produce a cash operating margin of between 17 and 21 million Australian dollars. I'm proud to say that after six months, we are already at 13 and a half million dollars. So we have uh, guided the market uh, towards the upper end. We, we are a company that's focused on growth, not just organic growth through normal expansion and, and uh, success in uh, uh, our exploration assets, but also through uh, inorganic uh, acquisitions. And in that regard, we have strategically acquired the Merlin Diamond project here in Australia. It's a 4.4 million carat resource. And when we bring that into production over the next two years, uh, it will be Australia's largest producing diamond mine. I mentioned uh, another aspect to growth and, and one of those important to us is obviously Kimberlite exploration success. And in that regard, we are significantly advanced in one of the most prospective Kimberlite exploration programs uh, in Africa the Lulo joint venture, where we are searching for the primary sources of the very special diamonds that we are mining on the very same ground. Thanks to the strength in our operations over the first six months, uh, the strength in the market, as well as the recent raising that we have concluded on the back of uh, the Merlin acquisition, we are in our best financial position ever, and we have some 27.6 million uh, cash and attributable cash on our balance sheet. The market is resurgent. 2019, it was a very tough year in our diamond space. In 2020, the world all but ended. Um, you know, but what a difference a year makes. You know, a year ago, we were struggling to give our diamonds away. Uh, today, we cannot produce enough. Um, the market is strong, and we don't see that changing uh, anytime soon. And I'll take you through some slides on that as well. Unfortunately, the producer equities have not tracked the same resurgence in the di rough diamond price particularly, uh, and we see ourselves trading at a, a significant discount even to the carrying value or the book value of our net assets on our balance sheet. But for all the reasons I've just outlined to you on this slide, we do believe there's a significant re-rating coming for our stock, so uh, continue to watch our story closely. I noted two of those mines that we have developed, they are niche production assets. The Lulo mine in Angola, in which we own 40%, is the highest dollar per carat diamond mine in the world. Our 70% owned Matai Kimberlite operation in Lesotho is the second highest dollar per carat Kimberlite mine in the world. This slide is going to get a bit busy, so please do not read it all. I'll outline what you should be looking at. Of the metrics that we guided the market to, the cash operating margin uh, in the Lulo mine is going to be between 28 and 32 uh, million Australian dollars this year. Our attributable portion going to be somewhere between 11 and uh, 13 million dollars. Our mine in Lesotho, 
Again, 11 to 16 million Australian dollars in cash operating margin. Our attributable portion is going to be, uh, why is that not coming up? There we go, 8 to 11 million Australian dollars. As I mentioned to you, after taking into account the corporate overhead here in Australia, uh, we have guided the market to 17 to 21 million Australian dollars for the full financial year. How have those assets performed? Um, I'm not sure why it's not coming up. I think perhaps the, uh, the presentation is not 16 by 9, but 3 by 4. Um, but if you have a look at the, the operation so far for the first six months, 11 million Australian dollars produced in cash operating margin on an attributable basis in uh, uh, Angola. And if you have a look at it in uh, Lesotho, 4.1 produced uh, already 13 and a half, as I noted to you um, on the earlier slide. So operations are performing well. They're in a good market, sending product to market in a, in a strong pricing environment. We are expecting more of the same for the second uh, half of this year. I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining to you why we're lagging um, and why we do believe that there's a significant re-rating coming. On this slide, I'm not being selfish and only promoting us. I am going to list a few other diamond producers who are suffering the same uh, consequence, but I don't think that's going to last for too much longer. On that slide, the black graph there represents the global rough diamond price uh, since the beginning of uh, January 2019 to where we are today. Unfortunately, when the pandemic arrived in February 2020, it all but shut down our uh, uh, industry and diamond prices uh, did fall off a cliff. But where we are today, diamond prices have come back very strongly, thanks to a lot of people that uh, spent time buying products as opposed to traveling, but also when the economies opened up because of the depletion of those uh, polished inventories, uh, prices uh, were resurgent. So we are 20% ahead today where we were back in January 2019. Uh, and those diamond prices are the highest they have been uh, since 2014, so, so a seven-year high. If you map the producer equities against that graph, yes, when the market softened in 2019, you saw all the producer equities price, share prices soften as well. And when the pandemic hit, we all fell off a cliff. But if you look at what has happened since, the only diamond company, producing company, that tracked the return uh, of the rough diamond price was the largest listed major in El Rosa. Everybody else has basically just tracked along the bottom. And so for us, therein lies the opportunity. I think the sheer size of what is being produced, not just by ourselves, but by the other producer equities, when we show continued cash generation from our operations, that gap is going to narrow very, very quickly. Is it a short-term epiphany? Is it a short-term rise in diamond prices? Uh, we certainly don't think so. We know that rough production is 30% below its highs of 2005 six when 177 million carats came to the market. Where we stand today and over the next five years, it is just going to be around about 128 million uh, carats on average. There are no big mines coming into production that is going to change that. So when you look at the work that uh, Bain and Company, who I'm sure most of you in this room know, have done, they do an annual report on the diamond industry and show what they predict as the supply demand fundamentals for our industry. So that first graph that you see there or line is the diamond supply in uh, US dollar terms over the period to 2020. As you can see, we are at our lowest ebb in 20 years. What's going to happen going forward? They have predicted that rough diamond supply is going to grow at only 1% on a compound annual growth rate. When you map that against the demand on a low demand basis, which they expect to grow at 4% compounded annually, uh, there is a big gap that is developing. When you have a look at their optimistic uh, demand scenario, which they expect to grow at a 6% compounded annual growth rate, that gets even larger. If you have a look at an optimistic supply scenario, uh, that really just tracks the low ebb in, um, uh, in the demand. But as I mentioned to you, there are no carrots outside of the ones that we know about coming to the market over the next five to 10 years. So the only thing that can really fill that gap is going to be a support in the price and a rising price. So over the next 10 years, we look forward to bringing more production from our two fantastic mines into the market. 
but we also look forward to bringing into production our new asset here in Australia, which is the Merlin Diamond uh, project. In the Northern Territory here in Australia, there is a mining tenement. Surrounding that mining tenement is an exploration uh, license called the Orbit Tenement. On that ground, Ashton Rio Tinto discovered a number of kimberlites. Uh, they have discovered 11 kimberlites. There are more dots on that uh, uh, map because some of those are blows as well. The majority of them have been on the mining lease. Contained in the, those kimberlite pipes is a resource of 4.4 million carats. 2.2 of which are in the indicated category. In addition, on this ground, there are some 70 unresolved geophysical anomalies that we want to go and test because we do believe there is significant exploration potential on this ground. In addition, there is a large magnetic anomaly which we want to go and have a look at. I don't believe, or we don't believe that is a, a kimberlite pipe, but we do want to go and test it. And just to give you some neurology, that is 40 kilometers south of the MacArthur River uh, lead zinc mine as well. So when you see that project with this opportunity available in Australia, would you go and have a look at it? And the obvious answer is yes. So we signed binding agreements to acquire 100% of this ground. As I mentioned to you, a lot of those kimberlites were discovered by uh, Ashton and Rio Tinto and operated for four years, extracting some 500,000 carats uh, from those uh, kimberlites. They sold the diamonds for, on average, around about $103 per carat. Where the diamond price index has gone today uh, since 2003, we are looking at a three-fold increase in diamond price. However, I've put that diamond on the slide just to outline to you what we expect from the large stone contingent that is uh, going to come out of this uh, uh, operation. That diamond there is the 104 carat diamond recovered from the Gareth pipe. It is the largest diamond ever recovered in Australia. At the time of recovery, it was valued at $500,000 a carat. So, sorry, not per carat, $500,000 in total money. Um, I wish per carat. Um, that today is worth three to four million dollars. So you are looking at a six to eight times uplift as opposed to just a threefold uplift on the global rough diamond price index. And therein lies a lot of opportunity for us as a large stone uh, producer where we have integrated through the pipeline and we are also cutting and polishing our diamonds. I mentioned the resource again of 4.4 million carats because it's significant and strategic to us as a company. It grows our attributable resource carats 500%. So we are going to be operating for many, many decades to come. <clears throat> it was in a liquidation process, so therefore, generally, you are going to pick it up at a lower end cost. We offered eight and a half million Australian dollars for this project, which was accepted at two dollars per resource carrot. Now, to draw a comparison to other operations uh, in our stable, we acquired the Matai mine in Lesotho for twelve Australian dollars per resource carrot. So we did really pick up a great asset here for a low end cost. Multiple development opportunities. We all know that the earth is a great vault and store of diamonds, but can you develop a mining extraction methodology and processing that's going to deliver value to us as a company and to our shareholders? And the answer is yes. We see near term, medium term and long term developments. On the bottom right hand side there, you see an open pit conventional extraction methodology and you see open pit vertical mining, which is almost like a shaft system. And we do see developments beyond that in two of the clusters for underground. On top of that, I've outlined the 70 anomalies already. We see significant potential in extending that resource as well. So when we bring it into operation over the next 24 months, it will be our third producing asset. And we do believe it's going to be Australia's largest. Currently conducting our scoping studies on all three methodologies, uh, and we do look forward to bringing those to the market over the next couple of months as well. We are the operators of a very, very significant exploration asset in Angola, probably the most exciting ground uh, in our space. And I can say that because we are recovering large, high-value diamonds very frequently. On the top right-hand side there, you see the frequency or the rate at which we recover those. Unlike a lot of other mines or other grounds, that would be an intermittent, sporadic or ad hoc graph. Look at the concentration at which we are recovering them. They're large, brittle shaped. They don't have any rounded edges. Those are all proximity indicators to where we are, are, are looking for the source. So if you, are look, if you look underneath you, then look at the, the, the map on the left-hand side. 
We have a significant number of anomalies underneath us. We have to methodically work through them. We have done that over the last four to five years. We have drilled 120 targets, discovered 107 kimberlites. We've sent 81 of the drill core away for mineral chemistry analysis in Canada, and we've identified the 18 high priority targets, the yellow dots, if you can see them on that map, um, which we are now currently bulk sampling. We started with at the wide end of the funnel, we are now at the narrow end of the funnel, extracting that ground, and we're gonna start putting those through the plant as well. We've just recently ordered a Kimberlite bulk sampling plant, standalone crushing circuits fleet. We are gonna be putting that dirt through uh, at a rate of knots, and we hope to find what we've been looking for fairly, fairly soon. We do have two other projects, um, earlier stage projects here in Australia in Brooking and uh, in Botswana, the Arapa project. Please come and visit us uh, at our booth. Um, my time is running out and we'd love to take you through what we are doing there because they too are very prospective uh, assets. So I'm going to, or not, um, to producing high value mines, generating good cash flows as we have guided the market to. We have got exceptional development uh, value that's gonna come to the fore over the next uh, 24 months and we'll bring those scoping studies to you over the next couple of months as well the most significant exploration ground in our space, and we are adding to that with our Merlin opportunity, and those programs are well-funded. If you have a look at the diamond market thematics that are outlined over two slides previously, our space has never been in a better position, well-balanced and probably in its best position for the, for the latter two or the last two decades. We're extremely well-funded, as I mentioned earlier. We're gonna run hard at all of our projects, and because we're able to do that, we should be you know, extracting the value that uh, we know are there. So please do take the time, come and see us. Uh, let's uh, explain to you how we've integrated through the diamond pipeline, how we have taken our projects from exploration evaluation stages through development, uh, through mining, and then starting to extract additional value from beyond the mine gate as well, and how we're doing that on our Merlin project and what we've got in store for our future at Bula Booking and Arapa as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.